Welcome back, I'm Kim Bailey, she's Juliana Osborne and this is Inside Exec. Today we're talking with Libby Pease and I'm going to have Juliana do the introduction yet again. Welcome Libby, thank you. Libby and I have known each other for a fair bit of time. Libby is a specialist in the field of work health and safety. I actually would go as far as say, not just a specialist, but an expert from my experience. Libby worked in a number of organisations both blue collar based and white collar based, large organisations like global and small to medium. She's the person to go to, whether you need to set up OK Health and Safety or Work Health and Safety from the beginning, whether you've got a disaster on your hand <laughs> and you need her to clean it up, whether it's the legal aspects, whether it's training people, whether it's to do with anything setting up a system for work health and safety. We'll hear a lot more about Libby's experience in a minute. So with that, I'll hand back to Kim. Libby, what's the challenge in the work that you're doing? What's the, the personal challenge? For I, I think it's dealing with all different levels of management because you not only have to, or I shouldn't say management only, I should say across the whole organisation, because you not only have to work with management and even sometimes a, a board, but also the workers to get them to actually follow policies and procedures and, and what you're actually asking them to do to make them safe in the workplace. I guess my underlying feeling is that the hardest part is not actually getting people to do it, it's getting organisations to pay for the safety aspect of the work. I, I think that's getting better mm -hmm. because people see the value in it. And also, however, on the other side of that, I have been called in on a number of occasions after organisations are being prosecuted by statutory authorities because of uh, breaches in health and safety legislation. I've actually done that a number of times, but hopefully they do it because they see the value in it and the value add that it can bring to an organisation. Is there a common area that we still fall down in? Workplace safety wise? No, it's a bit of a mixed bag okay. really. There's yeah. different elements because each business, as you can imagine, has different challenges. There's the workplace that they have to deal with, but then there's also the, the workers. Every business is a little bit different, so they have different hazards, they have different risks. Their demographics can be different. They can be in more than one location. Also too, believe it or not, language can be an issue mm -hmm. where you may be employing people where English is not their first language. So you have to deal with those aspects as well. Have you seen a, a trend towards a more global approach to getting people trained? I'm thinking more about my experience with the construction industry was going back probably 20 years now, where to come onto a work site, you had to do, you were required to do the site safety course before you started to work on the, on the site. And I was just at the edge, when I left, I was just we were just at the edge of the industry, we were talking about having a global course so that you did one course and you could go on any site. Is that the biggest change you've seen? For the construction industry, definitely. But there's other types of industries, like, for instance, if you work with um, chemicals, and those chemicals can be uh, pesticides, they can be acids, they can be alkalines, even, you know, some alkalines can be quite quite dangerous. And so people still need specific types of training. Again, like you take a um, uh, commercial cleaning organisation, they may have lots of chemicals where they need training and so forth. So it's not necessarily sometimes, you know, a one size fits all mm -hmm. when it comes mm -hmm. to training. Mm -hmm. And you need specific uh, training for different tasks mm -hmm. that you're asking people to do. The other thing that, that always used to amuse me in that instance, because obviously I was female doing site safety training in a very male oriented world, was the resources that were available for me to use in terms of video or uh, written documentation were all very much about blood and gore and this is what, you know, <laughs> the, the big stick, this is what's going to happen to you if you're not careful um, to try and shock people into thinking about safety in the workplace. Has that changed? Is it about the stick or is it about the carrot? I think these days it is probably more the carrot. I mean, I've always kind of been against blood and gore and more related to the workplace so that people can actually, when you're doing training, they can see how it relates to them. I guess you can introduce an, an element of, of gore, but I usually keep that to a very minimal um, <laughs> you know, level, because, I mean, who wants to see blood and gore? Yeah. People go to the movies to do that, not go to work. <laughs> <laughs> so 
So I guess my training's always very, been very uh, site specific and task specific because if you go into other industries or try and mix and match, it never seems to work, and they don't get the message because they don't because they can't relate to it. On the other side of the coin, have you seen a change in the work-related injuries? Is there is there injury or issues that are coming up now that you haven't? You didn't see when we first started out? I don't think so. I think one of the things when I go into an organisation, one of the first things I do is get to know the workplace. Mm. And to do that, you learn what the hazards are. Yeah. And once you know what the hazards are and what the risks are, you can pretty much know what types of injuries are going to be occurring. Mm -hmm. And also, all you have to do is look at your um, you know, accident incident history to also mm -hmm. get a fair idea. Have you seen, on the other side then of the coin, have you seen an improvement in, in some of the things that we would have seen as, as workplace injury or issues? So the, the occupational overuse syndrome and when mm -hmm. keyboards and, and computers yeah. were first introduced and the way people sat in their chairs. Have you seen, is there an improvement in that? Or this, I know there's still room for improvement. Yeah. <laughs> I think some of that has also been led by the legislation. Mm -hmm. You're probably aware that in Australia legislation changed in 2011 and that brought in a lot of uh, very specific factors that businesses had to deal with. Things like working at height, hazardous substances and so forth and that made them more uh, mindful of how to deal with those issues. So I think there's an element of where incidences are reducing, however sometimes the severity of the injuries are staying the same. Right. No, but that's Fascinating, really, because I would have expected that with the opportunity for, on the design side of things, for, for design to change and to for materials in terms of furniture even, mm. uh, to have given us more opportunity to make it a, a safer, more comfortable workplace than mm. it appears to be. Well, the problem is, is that each workplace is very different, yeah. and so again, you get back to looking at your risk factors and yeah. so forth yeah. to deal with uh, how best to deal with yeah. those. I remember a fellow I worked with a long time ago who worked in a, a process on a process line, and he said the only thing that they had as a, a safety activity the whole time was that a bell rang every 20 minutes to keep them awake. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh. It's a bit scary. Really. <laughs> We're going to let Fuliana say something now because, yeah. as you know, you know, if we get more than eight or nine minutes into the podcast and she hasn't said something, she gets um, tapping on the table. Me. You know when you were talking about the, the motivation or the carrot, so mm. is it now not that safety is important because it will help me meet my targets and get my sales in rather than if I take a shortcut, I'm going to lose people and people are going to be, you know, I'm not going to have the staff and I'm not going to be able to do it because legislation, I'll be sued, my reputation, stuff like that. Mm. Does that work? It does. Mm. And also too, I, I think that's what you've really got to aim for. Mm. Because one of the things that I really uh, kind of zero in on is looking at the quality of the work that people yeah. do. Because quality is becoming, yes. well, quality has been around for quite a while, but I think it's getting a higher rung on the ladder these days. Yeah. But that also impacts on you know, health and safety. Is you want to put out a good quality item or a product. And so by taking shortcuts or doing it, or doing it faster than you should, tends to, over a period of time, reduce because you lose your concentration. So for you then, you've been you know, working in that space mm -hmm. for a long time. What, what's the attraction for you? What, what is it? What drives you? What makes you want to work in that area? I actually get quite a bit of satisfaction out of um, seeing things mm -hmm. develop and, and be mm -hmm. implemented and improve. I think there's an element of also working with people. Yeah. And, and, that, and as I said earlier, working with everybody from board members to, you know, the cleaners and the receptionists. And, I, and that has an attraction to it. I worked in a business once where we had actually taken over a large, actually we bought out another state. I went down to have a look and have a look at the work sites and so forth. And over a period of the first six to eight weeks of taking over that company, everybody seemed to come to me because I had gone out, I'd seen the workplaces, I'd met the managers and even the supervisors and some of the workers. Mm -hmm. 
And I kind of knew the business from the ground level. And so even the senior management were coming to me saying, well, you know, who do I call in here? And that was the other thing is when I went down there, I asked one of the managers for a phone book. And so I had everybody's phone number. And so they were all coming to me saying, can we borrow your phone book, please? Yeah. Yeah. Because they hadn't, you know, none of the managers, or senior managers mm. anyway, had gone down and done a bit of a road trip like I did. Yeah. <laughs> it's about getting to know the workplace. Yeah, yeah. And, and the managers and, and, and so forth. And you need to know the workplace yeah. before you can work out how, how they're going to be safe. Yeah. Yeah. I'm interested in those levels of the organisation. I think that we tend to think about safety being for everybody else. Mm. And that if we're a manager or senior executive or board member, that we need to have the reports come in to see that everyone's doing right. what they should be doing. But how does it relate to me? You know, what should I be doing? Really, mm. yeah. and we ignore the fact that that we're part of that environment, and we should be as safe as we can be as well. Mm. But do you strike that? Actually, it's interesting because one organisation I worked for, I actually used to get on quite well with the majority of the board members. And um, one year, um, I made them up like what I referred to as like um, Easter show bags. Yeah. <laughs> and so I made each of the board members I made up because we'd also introduced some new personal protective equipment. And so again, to set the scene, I wanted them to actually wear it, just mm -hmm. like the workers. Mm -hmm. And so I made up these little packs for all of them. And uh, at the next board meeting, I went in and handed them all out. They got their specific little um, show, you know, bags. show bags <laughs> with all their goodies in it. But depending on the size of the organisation, sometimes some boards can have subcommittees, and usually one of those subcommittees is risk management, and that's where I usually fall into, mm -hmm. dealing with a, a business. And most boards these days uh, receive health and safety reports, and that depends on what they want to look at. And so for their own personal uh, corporate governance and due, di due diligence. Mm -hmm. And so usually I talk to them, find out what they want me to report on. And then I can e either do that monthly or bi-monthly, depending on what they want. Mm -hmm. And that's fairly large businesses. But then also smaller businesses need to be aware of you know, their corporate governance and also due diligence as well. And one of the ways that I do that, especially with smaller organisations, is when they have management meetings, that um, health and safety is a permanent agenda item so that they can tr keep track of what's happening and, and have people report to them uh, what's happening in the business. Do you find that they ask questions or do they just want the information? Oh no, sometimes they'll actually come out and say, oh Libby, can you come and have a chat to, yep. to us and you know, explain to us about you know, something that they're interested in. It might be you're implementing a new program and they might want more information or more results uh, than what you've provided. And that's fine. I mean, I don't have a problem with that. And, you know, because the more they know, um, you know, the better off I am because it means that they're informed. Apart from the legislation that was introduced in 2011, have you seen in your time a, a, um, more acceptance of this being a general management issue that has to be addressed at every management meeting? Oh, I think so. I think so. Actually, I said to Fuliana, you know, this afternoon, I've got to go see a client. And there's only 10 employees in, in Australia, and there's 15 employees in New Zealand. And they've employed me to mm -hmm. develop mm -hmm. a, a manual for them. You can see from that example how important work health safety mm. is and how switched on this company is mm. uh, in asking you to come in and, and work on that. Um, that. That sort of be setting it up from scratch or they already got something and then... They've got a few rudimentary mm. type things but what's happened is, is they've actually also changed the legislation right. in 2015 in New Zealand. Mm -hmm. And so they want, they can see that, you know, that potentially that, you know, the, the issues in New Zealand, they need to get a, their head around. Mm -hmm. And it's easier for them, easier for management to call somebody in who's familiar with it and has an understanding of it. 
and then can answer their questions or answer an email or whatever. Mm -hmm. Another example of that, and Bullyan has heard me talk about one other company that um, I've worked with for many years, probably about, must be getting up about 10 years now, and it's a cleaning company. And when they started, they only had about 30 employees, mm -hmm. and now they have about 140. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so over that period of 10 years, you know, we've had to improve things mm -hmm move things along mm. and recently I just had, well not recently, last year I had them certified for quality, health and safety in the environment which was That's great. A, pretty yeah, big, yeah. Yeah. a pretty big job yeah. but uh, yeah. they made it. They did. Yeah. And, and do you see that, is that something that is an increasing trend that people are looking for certification in that area? Well when you go for tenders these days or especially government tenders yep. you have to be certified. Right. And that was the idea with what they were after, was because they wanted to go mm. after government tenders. Yeah. But also, too, other councils these days require you know, certification. So it's becoming more prominent. You don't have to become certified, but you can follow the certification rules. Yeah. And a lot of organisations do that. When you get called in and, and you work on something like that, do you end up, as a consultant, that is, do you end up having at least one person in the organisation that wears that hat, maybe not as a full time, so they have a single point after you leave the organisation? It, it depends on how big the organisation is. Again, as an example, I'll use the cleaning company, where yeah. one of their directors yes. is the authorising person. Mm -hmm. But yet I deal a lot with, I go on site. Yeah. with them and I deal a lot with the supervisors and yeah. of course I've got to know the supervisors yeah. over the years, over the years so uh, they're quite used to me. Mm. But pretty much the, one of the directors of the company is, um, is responsible mm. and then this client I'm seeing this afternoon also he's the um, owner of the company. So it, again it proves that if there is focus from the top and mm. genuine so it makes it better mm. and easier to, to carry on with safety. Mm. Yeah. I think that seems like a good spot to take a pause in our discussion with Libby. I'm Kim Bailey, she's Juliana Osborne. We are talking with Libby Peace about workplace health and safety and this is Inside Exec.